Hello, welcome to this week's Dividend Cafe a podcast. We're here with our whole investment committee doing an early week kind of check-in. Um, we're, we're debating what we want to call it, a podcast or video or whatnot. Here, I think we go a podcast because that's how most people listen to it. And then to the extent someone's watching the video right now, they kind of know it's a video because mm-hmm. they're watching it. Yeah, that's a good point. All right. Yeah, I think that's good. I'm yeah. still so, not comfortable saying so vidcast. Self-evident. Is yeah. vidcast a real word? We can add it to the lexicon. I think yeah. that works. Yeah. yeah. Uh, is that what the young the young people are saying? It I wouldn't. I wouldn't know. You T- would know? Tell us, Robert. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so listen, a lot of stuff going on in the markets. We uh, uh, can kind of do a quick summary of where things are at a macro level. Obviously, we've spent the last couple of weeks talking about our view on equities. It's a more sanguine environment with a little relief in trade war fears and in. Um, and and, uh, monetary policy, and then the earnings results for the quarter not becoming worse than people expected, a mostly pretty benign result, and then we sort of prepare for the end of the year and go into 2020 with a reasonably um, uh, open appetite for risk, I think, for most uh, risk-oriented investors. Um, One of the things, though, that gets ignored is what we're going to focus our topic on today is how a lot of these things – that have made for a more sanguine environment for equities in the U.S. actually benefit emerging markets. And you look back to 2018, it was a very difficult year for EM equity investor, um, unlike 2017 and 2016, which had both been gangbusters in emerging markets equities. But in 18, it was the same things I just said that that were fearful in, in the risk environment for U.S. were particularly weighing on emerging trade wars, impacting global trade flows and therefore economic opportunity out of a lot of the emerging economies. And then in monetary policy, to the extent you get a, a stronger U.S. dollar, tighter flows, you have so much dollar-denominated debt in emerging markets that it, it becomes you know, a, a real hurdle for those economies to have to overcome if you get global weakness. That held down EM, their PEs got to a point um, of about on an index level, at one point they were trading forward ten to eleven times. Um, so you had far higher growth rates trading at a much lower um, valuation, and and so we maintained our view coming into this year. And frankly, EMs performed very well as all risk has this year. But it isn't like EM has outperformed S and P's this year, which you kind of should have expected given the macro environment. Therefore, on a relative basis. My thesis would still be going into 2020 that EM is undervalued as a growth asset class relative to U.S. equity. And I think the reason why we all need to discuss this today on the podcast is kind of bounce around what that means, how we want to be affected there, what it looks like to debt, to equity, but also what is unique about our view as emerging markets equity investors Brian, you've been with me the longest in this worldview. We've been invested in EM equity since the financial crisis. Um, do you feel any differently about the asset class now than than we would have a couple years ago? It's cheaper. Yeah. Yeah, it's cheaper. Uh, but no, the underlying thesis is the same, which is that we, you know, we want to own companies, bottom up companies in these uh, uh, countries, whether they're um, located in this country or that, uh, isn't all that important. It's more about. Uh, the growth trajectory of that business, and that that business is reliant upon the consumption of that country, so that emerging consumer um, versus sort of an export-led type of business like a commodity play or an oil play or something like that, where really they're selling electronics or commodities across to the developed world. We want to we want to own companies in the emerging world where that growth is based on, <clears throat> you know, the the you know the middle class uh, growing in that area and, and consumption of that area. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, Dea, we we have met over the years with our uh, emerging markets uh, equity managers, and and you've gotten a chance, I think, to be sort of evangelized the way that I was many years ago around the idea that a lot of people in the U.S. that are investing in emerging markets think they're investing in a different asset class, emerging markets equity, and are really investing with leverage on investments that play the U.S. market the way that certain companies in China or Taiwan or South Korea or Hong Kong might sell to U.S., very commodity-dependent. And and the rethinking as to how we approach the asset class being more driven by domestic growth and domestic consumption, do you believe that we've gotten anything wrong in that thesis that we've played out at Bonson Group over the last 10 years? 
that we've got anything wrong in the implementation of that? And, and, and in that philosophy that the right way to be invested in EM is for EM growth, not for EM selling things to Americans. I, I think we've been very, very consistent in our application, that belief. I, uh, we've never strayed from it. As far as, uh, as far as really what we, like you said, like you and Brian said, what we're focused on, those are focused on those companies that are, uh, you know, that are playing that consumer, that emerging consumer story, that are leveraged to that, uh, you know, companies that have good forward demographics. Uh, where where that where that growth rate is there and and the reason why we don't uh, and there's different ways to play that I I've, I've looked at many different managers that might uh, invest in companies uh, that are domestically based here in the U.S. but sell to emerging market consumers and the reason why that's less attractive for us is that those are yeah there's they're they're still playing that same theme as far as the emerging emerging consumer goes but the valuations aren't there like they are and for uh, for companies that are headquartered emerging markets. I mean, and that's, and the reason why those valuations are there is because of all those things you mentioned around volatility and geopolitical risk. It creates uh, low multiples. You have, you know, f on a forward basis, I think uh, EM's now about 12 or 13, uh, yeah. about, about 1.5 sales or something. So, I mean, finding companies that are compounding capital at that kind of rate, trading those valuations only exist uh, in EM. So mm -hmm. uh, that, we've been pretty consistent in, uh, and managers that are are biased towards towards that philosophy and putting and putting capital with them. Julian, yeah. when you think about the risks in EM equity that are distinct from U.S. equity, what is at top of your list if you had to pick between one of these two: geopolitical or currency? Um, a good question. I guess they probably uh, correlated to each other in the sense that I would say, like, if you have ge geopolitical risk, you probably gonna it's gonna impact the currency as well. So I'm not. I don't know if they're really different, or if you could, you know, you could say that they're the same risk at the end of the day. Um, in the sense that uh, you know instability will have a lot of uh, impact on the on the currency of the the, the country that's uh, that's. Uh, that, you know, it's impacted. Like I don't know if you look at uh, Chile at the moment, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, so I would, uh, I guess, I would put them uh, in the same basket. So mm -hmm. that's a that's a good point. They're not distinct risks. They they manifest themselves differently, but they're highly correlated to one another. W uh, what right now do you think is the headwind uh, for EM? That is, as Dave was talking about, the valuation not having kind of a normalized. Um, are people worried the dollar is going to continue going higher? Um. I guess um, the way you know the Fed has been uh, cutting rates, so it, it should be the other way around. I guess um, you know uh, the dollar is should you know based on rate expectation, you wouldn't expect the dollar to be going higher. It's uh, I think at the end of the day, uh, the multiple discount is probably just you know reflection that historically it's always been at a discount. You don't even have to look at emerging markets. You look at Europe. You know everybody. You know why is Europe uh, at a discount to the US? Because you have less growth, because you have uh, instability, and because I think there's always going to be this is I think you know another thing we need to think about is the asset management industry is something that's done out of the U.S. by American people, and you're always going to put a premium on your you know the companies you know the best and you are based here and there are more stability, and it's, I guess in the sense that when you have like a correction, we all want to go back to large cap equities or we all want to go back to owning the treasuries. You know, when there's, a, you know, when there's uh, uncertainty in the world, you're going to start selling emerging market for us. You're going to start selling, uh, uh, you know, high yield bonds and go into what you, you feel is safe, for, which would be large cap U.S. equities. And it's probably why there's this discount that, you know, I, I feel like might be, might be, um, will never disappear. Maybe sometimes be less of a discount. But it probably always be at a discount. Mm -hmm. Well, so so Robert, Julian brings up a really important point that I think is actually illustrated in the performance attribution within emerging markets. And mm -hmm. we're not going to say any specific company sure. names, but to his point that people are defaulting to what they're most comfortable with or what they know the best, mm -hmm. we actually see that even within EM, that some of the very big mega cap names that are actually kind of now household names, even though they're in China, they're not trading at thirteen times earnings day. They're trading at 35 to 50 times earnings. So even in the end, people are defaulting to the comfort level. Mm -hmm. Is there an opportunity that comes from people's fear of going to stuff that is new terrain? Absolutely there is. And I think that's why it's so important to have quality managers that have, in essence, kind of a boots on the ground approach. The, the, the macro, the top-down approach to 
EM is, is I think, inherently flawed because you're exposing yourselves, you know, call it 3X, 4X, to the geopolitics, to the currency issues. The companies operating in those places are looking to do one thing, you know, sell their good or service and, and drive a profit. Something Julian also said uh, briefly about geopolitics and uh, currency issues. Yes, they're certainly correlated, but I think in some circumstances, one leads the other. I, I think back to Turkey a little bit, right? They had a ton of, uh, you know, foreign denominated debt right there. Well, that became a problem, and then it was perhaps suggestive of a, of a shaky geopolitical situation and, and politics in that country as well. So I think being able to look at all these different things in tandem with each other is, is really good, and they certainly are tied into each other. No, that's yeah. that, it's a very good point, and I wonder, I wonder if um, that is the risk premium that investors should be uh, craving, not not shunning. Yeah, and it's Dad touched on it earlier. The valuations there's there's certainly you know what we think might be a, a discount or our managers see as a discount, and it's because sometimes people look at the countries and they say, hey, maybe that country's shaky, this or that, or there's some issues on a, on a macro level. But the underlying companies that that we're investing in, our managers are investing in are very solid. So there's a, there's yeah. a very good value play there. Yeah, I think yeah. I think that this day I want you to comment on it. I think it comes down. He said people are afraid of uh, underlying shakiness in certain countries. Um, uh, you take a really huge U.S. mega cap company that might be based in Cincinnati, Ohio. Mm. Would anyone ever say I'm a little afraid of the compounding of X Y Z company because I don't know the the landscape in Cincinnati? Right? We don't think that way. <laughs> it's based on all totally different trends and realities economically, where their customer base is around the world. You just intuitively know that where XYZ company is based, by the way, can you think of some Cincinnati companies I might be referring to? <laughs> but, you know, we're just trying to make things easier for our regulators right now. Um, look, we, we would not never say I like Minnesota or I'm afraid of Cincinnati. But as EM investors, we do it all the time. Uh, is that logical? Or is it kind of the wrong way to think? Should people not be saying, I'm afraid of Chile, I'm afraid of Turkey, and instead focus on the growth multiples and fundamentals of the companies that are there? I, I think that uh, you, should, you should absolutely, and we obviously have a strong bias towards uh, managers that are focused on the fundamentals of the company. Now, that being said, you know every manager that we talk to does have some sort of macro view on the countries they're invested in. I mean, look, if uh, you could have found some really strong companies in Venezuela this year, but I mean the the currency's depreciated ninety percent against the dollar. So, so to an extent, you have to have some view about uh, uh, the just the framework, the rule of law, everything that goes into the system to be able to. Uh, to be able to have companies that are able to be profitable and compound capital over high high rates for a long period of time is really really important. And uh, and another thing is also the uh, uh, corporate governance is uh, this one of the things that we uh, not necessarily that we that we focus very heavily on an EM relative develop uh, develop uh, countries. We obviously want uh, you know a board and uh, management to be very aligned with shareholders. Especially when it comes to our dividend growth philosophy and and so on, be able to give that, be able to give those distributions back to the shareholders instead of uh, unnecessary investments for, uh, for you know for whatever reasons that aren't going to generate uh, that increase in you know uh, a return to capital above their cost of capital. But as far in, in EM, that that's a that's a that's a really uh, important facet to focus on there because it's 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 a lot rarer to find uh, boards and find companies that are aligned with shareholders. It, it isn't ex the exact same mentality uh, here, mostly in developed countries. And and not to say it isn't out there, Dean, it is, but just it's one thing that you have to focus on a little bit more in your screening I is love, is the yeah. corporate governance in EM. I love that you brought that up too because it, in my opinion, the, the G in ESG is where in emerging markets, the fiduciary responsibility lines up with profitability and good motives. Right, so you're not necessarily always worried about divesting from fossil fuels, just different aims that certain con countries or companies might have. Right, you're looking for not, solid a, not a lot of woke pension that, funds yeah, in uh, Ecuador. That's right. You're, yeah. you're looking you're looking for for alignment of, of shareholder and and management interest in, in yes, that situation yeah. you brought up. It's great. Yeah. And then the yeah. other thing maybe you should mention is you can achieve some of that you know um, uh, risk of setting with the diversification because when we talk about emerging markets, you really talk about like two big countries, China and India, and then you know. Brazil and Taiwan and Mexico and and so like if you have like a, some macro macro impact in Chile, it's gonna it should be positively you know um, 
meaningless to your portfolio if you own an emerging market por- for portfolio is relatively small. So it's diversification it's will, should help you. you know, yeah, but if, I think if, that you know. begs the question a little. Should it be that way? Like, should Chile be a small part? Should China be a big part if you're benchmark agnostic, if you're focused on where great companies are? And, and China becomes over 50% of the index, which it yeah. effectively has become. This was the issue of Brazil seven, eight, nine, ten mm-hmm. years ago. A couple energy companies out of Brazil became a really disproportionate weighting in the index. And it, to me, it spoke to an inefficiency in index construction and an opportunity for bottom-up investors. No, that's, I guess uh, that's a really good point. And that's really one of the issues with investing um, in emerging markets is that you have a limited uh, you know, supply or like a number of uh, large cap or company, listed companies that you can invest in. And so doing this bottom-up approach to, to find the, you know, the, pearl, the pearl jewel you can, uh, you can yeah. uh, find in each country is uh you think of it as much more value than where you know it's uh it's easier because you have a lot of uh liquidity or a lot of companies listed sure yeah and i think at the end of the day it comes all back to fundamentals again so so when you look at the world and you look at demographics you look at what's happening uh where the growth is in different pockets of the world whether it's emerging markets or developed and you look at what you have to pay to buy that growth uh, we find value in the emerging world because you're getting a higher growth rate for a cheaper multiple, right? Mm-hmm. And so, mm-hmm. but as far as you know, screening and, and you know, you know, you know, focusing on one country over the other uh, solely based on you know macro worldview of, of that country maybe growing more over, over a period of time, you may be right, you may be wrong. It's a heck of a crystal ball to pull out of your desk drawer to figure that one out, you know. But what I can say is that two and a half million people in India you know, had more than $10,000 in discretionary income in 1990, and now 50 million people do. And so they're buying things like toothpaste, and they're buying beer and meat and all those sorts of things. And so, you know, focusing on those types of realities and mm-hmm. investing in them is a very exciting paradigm. And I, I think that's what we do. We like to choose managers that are going to focus on where that growth is happening and how best to exploit it. There's always the, sort of that macro overlay, like like you mentioned. And, we, you know, we've talked about that quite a bit. Are there headwinds politically and geopolitical incidents and in, in currency issues, there always are, and there's headwinds and tailwinds. But at the end of it all, and the currency will follow suit, it's the fundamentals that drive the result over time. Well, so, Brian, let's go back to um, kind of around the time period you and I were entering the business and beginning to manage money for clients. And there was a fella um, who was head of uh, equities at the time at Goldman Sachs. Um, and I caught him, Jim, Jim O'Neill? James okay. O'Neill? Yeah, I, I, he's the one who coined the phrase um, uh, brick. Yeah, and and I apologize to Mr. O'Neill if I'm getting his name wrong, and I apologize to yeah. that other guy if I'm getting his name wrong because it would be Mr. O'Neill, be someone else. <laughs> right. I think it is James O'Neill, but yeah. he, he the idea was Brazil, Russia, India, China. There was a secular thesis formed around this incredible investable opportunity in a new global economic paradigm of these countries being very commodity heavy that were going to um, be really useful in the next uh, 50 years. And it was demographic driven and it was very commodity driven and particularly out of Brazil, Russia and, and China more so than India. And and he ended up being really right in, in the first 10 years. So this, I think his, his thesis on it came out right before 9-11 and then even kind of in a post 9-11 world, when you think to the really bad equity returns in 01, 02, emerging markets equity were still performing really well. China's expansion was going on. There was uh, this, inc- Jim Rogers was writing all about the new commodity revolution and, and it was working. Mm. George Bush was a weak U- dollar president. Mm. Dollar uh, Euro was really advancing, dollar declining. So all those things paved together as you and I were uh, managing monies around the uh, EM story. And I didn't, and I didn't really get it. I didn't really comprehend it. And I was a little bit afraid of it because it was post Enron, post uh, Arthur Anderson accounting scandals. And I said, "Well, God, if we can't trust the accounting firms in the U.S., I don't trust the accounting firms in yeah, Moscow." Absolutely. Or you know. And so then, and then as we studied it over the years, we've taken the thesis on that we've taken here now. But my question is: Was the EM thesis of two thousand <laughs> and what we believe was Mr. O'Neill's brick formulation? flawed itself to be focused more on commodity growth and not population growth demographics this is where i think people are missing when they get caught up into what uprisings may have happened in chile over a weekend is back to your point on the reason i'm presenting this to you is you brought up the toothpaste Mm -hmm. i think of america post-war and the incredible middle class opportunity for consumer products that need to be bought as their sort of modernity was coming to middle America. Well, modernity is literally coming 
to billions of people in different yeah. countries. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if that's the buying thesis for emerging markets over the next 10, 20, 30 years. 1,000%, I would agree with that. And and, it, and and on the fringes, there's probably a whole lot of other exciting things that will occur and, and they're investable and, and I know that they'll work well too. But at the end of the day, if you could go back to, like you said, post-World War II in, in the US and simply just invest in the staples of this country. Would they call it what Nifty Fifty? Mm -hmm. You know, whatever, mm -hmm. whatever it was. You know, Procter Gamble. You know, you know, you know, you know, companies that make toilet paper and toothpaste and and just consumer goods and and you know, focus on just the growth of uh, the inevitability of people making more money, having more disposable income, wanting something better for their family than they did that the, the maybe they had, an improved standard of living over time. That is a trajectory that is very stable. It's very consistent in history. And if you think about the opportunity in the emerging world with the amount of that happening right now, th you know that's what we're trying to focus on with our, when we say consumption-led companies, we wanna focus on companies that are producing those products that are fueling that uprising of the middle class from, you know, like I said, two and a half million in India to 50 million to you know, a billion at some point. It was Jim O'Neill, by the mm -hmm. way, confirmed. Mm -hmm. he, was, he ran uh, Global Economic Research for Goldman Sachs back then. Julian, um, what about the idea that this population story could be true and there, and there's this self-interest agenda that's going to play out for hundreds of millions of people in countries like India, various Southeast Asia countries? And, and sorry, sorry, when you say population, you're not, you're not meaning population growth, just the, the middle class story. Is that, is that what you're saying? Um, no, I think it's both. Yeah, it's I, I think it oh, is okay, it is okay. population growth. That Then there is mobility of a growing population for more to go from okay, okay. the bottom decile okay. into middle decile. Standard yes. of living increase. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would yeah. assume you meant the latter, but yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. There's like an OECD research that says 80% of the growth in demand from the middle class uh, you know, in the next decades is going to come from Asia. Yeah. It, you know, so oh, it's absolutely. Like, it's yeah. like Europe and, I mean, developed world is, you know, growing single digit, low single digit inflation and the big growth is coming from Asia, yeah. demographics and and uh, new middle class, basically. But you, you you were running money in the 90s. And, and, and I want to ask you, well, before O'Neill wrote this paper on BRIC and before at Bonson Group, we formulated our thesis about the, the domestic growth opportunity. There was a, a Thai, Thai currency crisis in 97. There was a Russian ruble Russian, crisis yeah, in 98. Sure. There was a Mexican crisis in 94 that our, our own Treasury Secretary Bob Rubin played a big role in helping bail them out of. So there's been macro events that had rocked the boat before. Does that need to play a role in how we think about the asset class? Um, I guess it does. I mean, when you were saying earlier how uh, you know it's hard to invest in Asia when you can't even uh, trust you know uh, mm -hmm. you know uh, accounting firms sometimes like there were some big scandals in the US. I mean, my experience as well from you know uh, on the buy side for many years and working in hedge funds is like every time we there was a Chinese or Indian company or even if the management was uh, you know you say European company with some Indian management or Chinese management say oh. This is like a big red flag. We want to stay away, or we want to be really extra careful because it's not the same reputation, or it's not you know you, you have a bigger risk with uh, with. Uh, Russia is the epitome of that. I mean. Uh, yeah, well, Russia. We have, I would say I'd never we'd never touch anything in Russia, because but even in you know China and, yeah. or in in India, we would be extra careful. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, I guess as you uh, you put you know 10, 20 years of uh, of history in these companies, and and then you see. You know, there's, there hasn't been any accidents, so you get more comfortable, more confident owning them, and they, I guess with the westernized. But uh, I think you're always gonna have uh, probably um, a bit of a discount, or be, uh, I'm gonna have to do extra work to be comfortable with these companies. I, I agree. I think mm -hmm. one of the things too, on, on one of the managers that we focus on with the same type of thesis is is more of a dividend manager, right? Yeah. So there's an income component too, and the, the nice thing about that is it's hard to really fake a cash flow coming to you in the form of a dividend. It, it kind of solidifies the the feeling that the you know what you're seeing in the balance sheet and the income statement and things like that. It, it, it's obviously very true and legitimate because they're actually sending you the money, yeah. um, you know, versus just trusting that the company is going to grow and things. So we we've got a kind of bifurcated approach to to the emerging world. So speaking of that bifurcated approach, my th I always ask you guys questions that I already know the answer to, and I just try. But everyone always gets it right because we're so coherent and cohesive in the way we view these things. But my my view is that in the '90s. Um, those events that were really disruptive, that the capital markets in countries like Mexico and some of the larger of the EM countries versus what we would call frontier markets, mm -hmm. have uh, uh, they're unrecognizable compared to where they were in 1993 or 1997. Yeah. Then the 20 to 25 years that have gone by in our careers, these things have categorically changed. 
But I guess I'd ask you, Robert, would frontier markets, which for our listeners will define as not third world type countries, but fourth world countries, uh, Nigeria, some of the more South Sudan, the, yeah, Sudan, those places, yeah. oftentimes they're in Africa, there's some in South America, mm-hmm. but that are almost kind of another level of risk. Would you say that it's macro events that give us pause in frontier or is it company specific governance and, and also liquidity? I, the, oh, their I stock really, exchange. I'd say the latter. I'd say access is the biggest problem yeah. there. You look at some of the frontier markets and I know a lot of them do have, you know, ostensibly exchanges set up. There's perhaps one or two companies that trade on some of those exchanges. So we, yeah. we talked earlier about, you know, finding the right companies. That's, it's pretty hard to do even more so in frontier markets. Something you touched on earlier with the question, David, is the population growth. Is it is middle class versus uh, something else? In in emerging markets, it is more emer- emerging uh, middle class growth. Whereas with frontier markets, it's just you know increasing birth rates, things like that. They're getting access to medicines, so just there's greater population growth. That that part of it, you know, how much is investable? They're not necessarily spending as much money. They're trying to survive more so. Mm-hmm. I think what we're looking for more is the the emerging markets where they're starting to spend money. Rising standards of living, you know, those types of things. Sure. Good. So, yeah. Something you touched on earlier, too, about the specific types of companies. What, what I love almost as much as the, the companies themselves is the anti-cyclical nature mm. of consumer staples in these mm. countries, right? So we, we deal with macro factors. We deal with, you know, perhaps some, some issues with currency at, at a broad level. But people, like you said earlier, they're still going to hopefully buy toothpaste, buy diapers for their babies, things like that. And short of, a, you know, an embargo like we see in Venezuela— those those goods and services are hopefully still going to get access to the consumers in those countries. So yeah. I think that's a big differentiator. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. I think you can get quality growth in, yeah. in those countries. And I think the frontier world is difficult. It's difficult, even if we. It's difficult to invest in from the standpoint of there. There is a, a big macro uh, uh, unknowable there, more so than in some of the larger emerging world countries. And then also there's just technically not enough volume and liquidity for us to really okay. access them anyway. Yeah. Now, and, Robert, I think you have to jump out for a client call, right? That's correct. Yeah. Speaking of quality of, of life here, <laughs> why, why don't we let you jump out and we'll, we'll keep the conversation going. If we say anything on the podcast after you're gone that you disagree with, you'll get a chance to rebut <laughs> Sounds good. Ne- next week. Okay. Right. Thanks, guys. Yeah, um, yeah but, but, as, but as far as the frontier market is, con- is concerned, I mean, you ha- you have to – I mean, the country has to – there needs to be bare necessities. There needs to be something there to promote some form of capitalism. Sure. Or else how can a company – have any sort of reliable earnings or have any sort of relationship with shareholders or I really think any, that the issue and we've had these meetings with both of our emerging markets partners over the years at the end of the day it, it's kind of a moot point because even if you found um, criteria that you were you were you believe was acceptable the size of the emerging market investing world and the opportunity set in frontier is so small that to keep your liquidity um, and and your ability to trade in and out of a position uh, reasonable, the the percentage of uh, that you could acquire in a diversified emerging markets equity portfolio is so yeah. tiny that it can't move the needle. So you're sort of inviting um, some risk and some exposure without really any ability to enhance your return result. At least in any meaningful way. So you're saying it's a non-starter before you even look at the. The only case would be for someone with where is an appropriate risk appetite or an appropriate mandate. Mm-hmm. It would not be appropriate in my mind for the way we manage capital. There may be someone out there who just says, "I want to have a little window that's fully devoted to frontier," and almost look at it like a private equity <clears throat> part of their portfolio, where they said, "We'll have no liquidity. We're not going to be able to access." Yeah. But, you know, you're marked to market and, and everything. I just think it, it, I don't get it. But what I'd like, both as a, 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 you know, just from kind of citizenship standpoint, but also an investor opportunity in the future, is I'd like to see those fourth world countries become third world countries. Sure. And then I assume that when their governance and population maturity and economic opportunity and infrastructure in the mm. country grows, then so would their capital markets, exactly. and you'd have okay. a better investable opportunity. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. What yeah. is the what is the viewpoint of our committee on EM debt? Um, we spent some time with our manager on emerging markets fixed income. We've had we've enjoyed some wonderful returns. You know, basically double digit uh, total mm-hmm. return, low double digit returns in emerging markets debt on the year. Um, is it a big play on currency? Is, is there actual fundamental uh, bond fundamentals worth that that can be bought with higher coupons, so it's a nice spread product in your taxable fixed income. 
How do we want to think about um, emerging markets debt, Brian? Yeah, no, it is an asset class that we have owned and own, and there is opportunity there for those reasons. There's a higher coupon, just like you get a lower multiple on equity side, mm-hmm. you know, for 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 the same amount of growth or more growth. You get a higher coupon for something because there's a credit component to it, and there's the geopolitical and currency and the whole thing. The risk reward skew is kind of how you know we have to look at that and kind of base where those opportunities lie. But it's funny we're talking about the frontier world and some of the lower tiered credit quality uh, countries that are out there. And if you look at something like an index, like a like a you know an emerging market debt index, or you know on the on the on the debt side, and then you look at an index on the equity side, they're almost just shockingly different with the exposure, the country exposure, meaning that those lower credit quality companies have have a lot more leverage out there um, that's available. And, and so we, we would avoid that, in other words. So we're, we're selective on the equity side. We're selective on the fixed income side. We want to get paid. We want that re- extra coupon when we're going to buy an emerging market uh, debt. But we're not going to do so in, if it doesn't pencil from a risk reward standpoint. Do you have preference, uh, hard currency, local currency, or... I mean, I like the opportunity. You know, I, I I would say having the opportunity to own things in local currency is a good idea, Me too. Uh, and having managers be able to make that, um, that uh, you know that that play uh, based on having boots on the ground, having an office there, and understanding um, what's best for either whether it's equity or debt to be in local currency or not. I think it's a good thing to do. It's not something that we would do in house or anything, but yeah, you know, maybe, maybe it's also to discuss uh, hedging, uh, mm-hmm. what we think about currency exposure. Or specifically, why we don't hedge. Why well, we don't I think hedge. I think Julian, that's something we ran like, into. Yeah. Although it was Japan, not an mm-hmm. emerging market, um, but it's something we ran into with our our desire to get some dividend equity um, exposure mm-hmm. out of Japan. That we found the currency hedging costs were eliminating some of the dividend on an absolute basis. Is this a factor uh, with EM as well, whether debt or equity, that some of the currency side of things is kind of taking away from the cash flow the investments are providing. Um, uh, yeah, yes, for sure. I mean, if you want to hedge, you're going to have to pay for the cost of hedging, and that's sure. going to take a, a you know chunk of your uh, returns every year. So I guess, yeah, and that was one of my questions is, uh, I mean, I've seen uh, when we look at Japanese equities, we decided, uh, you know, not to hedge. We we own the ADRs, but uh, the underlying price is in, uh, in yen and, and the stock and the dividend will move in yen, but probably not too much volatility in, to, in the, the yen to dollar, so probably not worth hedging. But um, I, I guess for the other products, famous, famous last words. <laughs> 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 but uh, for the debt and uh, emerging uh, equity, emerging markets, I guess we own we own products that are trading in dollars, but we we take the underlying. Um, FX I, I don't know of anyone in the EM equity space that hedges currency. Now, maybe an asset allocator might, on a top down, throw in some dollar hedges. Too expensive, but it's way too expensive, yeah. and and too many. Too many countries, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. By the time you look across, because yeah, you have a basket of different equities, so can't do still, it. Yeah, yeah. can't yeah. do it. Uh, but with EM debt, I think currency hedges are, especially when you're very active, as our manager is. You have local, you have corporate, you have sovereign. Look, when you're buying uh, in local currency, sovereign debt, that's all you're buying. It's coupon and currency. Mm. You know, there's not even a credit component to it like there would be with the corporate aspect. So I think that our our uh, diversified emerging market debt strategy is heavily currency driven, but not all currency beta, not all short dollar. They're they're long and short around different currencies, which to your point earlier, is in a lot of ways a macroeconomic forecast around geopolitics, mm. around growth expectations, inflation expectations. They can. They can be wrong, yeah. but that's what they're attempting to go about doing and either add defense or add value. There, there's also, as far as the equity versus debt goes, one of the reasons why it makes more sense to hedge on the debt is that uh, there's this kind of counterbalance effect. If you do get a depreciation in the currency, you have, generally speaking, some of those equities might uh, might benefit a little bit more if they have an exporting side to them or you, you know, as far as their business goes. Um, yeah, I would argue back to my kind of first decade of this millennium mm-hmm. analogy that that, in fact, was a huge overstater of the EM equity returns was the, the, the depreciation the current. No, well, it, it depends what seat you're sitting in mm-hmm. dollar currency depreciation, but EM currency appreciation mm-hmm. that you basically had a fundamental earnings story that was providing X and you had a currency story that's providing another equivalent of X. So you're getting two X of the earnings story. And now this decade, you've gotten half of the X, of X, even though the earnings are higher this decade than they were last decade. Mm-hmm. So there, it's, all, it's a, been a currency story that has detracted from the return. But the point being, I had one hedge that out, 
their 20, 2000 to 2007 EM equity return would have looked categorically different. Absolutely. And I think, I think that's true on the Japan side as well, that um, the notion that let's get all the ideas out of Japan equity yet hedge the currency, even apart from the cost of the hedging, I don't know. There's been a lot of years that the yen's movement was was creating some of the return. Yeah. So I'm totally fine if someone says, I don't want currency headache. Just buy everything you buy U.S. dollar and buy it here in America and just don't be exposed to the realities of international currency markets. But my view on this uh, through a well, lot of trial and error is if you're going to be uh, take the risks of being an international global investor – then you got to take the currency risk. Sure. And it's but, not and a, yeah. I was going to say, you're going to be exposed anyway. I mean, if you buy S&P 500 companies, you're just giving, they're doing it for you. That's I mean, right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. a brilliant yeah, it's a point. Multinationals. So, yeah. like, Either we hear it in their earnings results yeah, every right. quarter. They come out and tell you, we made $4 a share, but if it wasn't for currency, we would have made $4.20 a share. They're taking the currency risk of the way that they sell their products overseas. I think it's better a, to invest in fundamentals and currencies play out over time. And, and if you look at the data, the, there tends to be a diversification benefit from having a different current, you know, di- different Definitely. exposure in your portfolio. So I, I think that it, it, it adds a benefit as, as there's more of a risk reduction uh, if you have a, uh, a portfolio with all these different exposures. But yeah, like Julian said, about 47% of uh, S&P 500 uh, company revenues are from overseas. So yeah, they're taking that. They're taking that risk for you. So. And so, let me ask that question. Yeah, do you you hear a few people more and more? I'm always uh, well. I'm not, I'm going to wait to tell you what I think, but um, I have a theory. But you do hear more and more people saying, "Oh, we don't need to go be investors in EM because when we buy X Y Z and A B C in America, they're such huge multinational global behemoths that so many of the customers for, let's say, the largest beverage companies and consumer product companies, they're selling to South America and Asia. So we're getting that exposure anyways. Um, So I don't hide the ball. My theory is that's just a lazy investor's excuse for not doing the homework necessary in emerging markets. But what would you say, Brian, to why that is or is not a valid argument against EM exposure, the idea that S&P companies are giving it to you anyways? Um, I mean, I guess I would say that they they are because they're seeing the growth opportunity there as well. And and so you get some kind of derivative exposure to an emerging market world as a small percentage of revenues or a percentage of revenues from an S&P 500 country, uh, company. But still, I mean, it, you're you're missing out on, um, you know, the um, uh, opportunities that are actually in, you know, actually in those countries and able to produce goods and services that are in those countries. So there, there's just two different opportunity sets. One's a very big, large cap type of play. One's a little bit more of a local uh, approach, and and I think that there's a, a reason you would own both of them. Yeah. Is there a valuation yeah. argument, yeah. Julian? No. Um, I guess uh, there is probably a valuation argument, like the, the discount uh, thinking that over time, you know, as these con- countries become more like uh, like us, you know, Westerns, and more, you know, uh, with um, more accountable boards and maybe more transparent, that you could see the discount, you know, uh, shrink over time. And that would be another reason. And more liquidity, you know, more flows as well going to uh, to these markets. You know, maybe, you know, Chinese people are going to start, having, you know, investing, having 401ks. And the same way, they're going to push their own stocks. So that's another way probably to uh, to get exposure, you know, being uh, invested uh, there directly. Yeah, that's yeah. cheaper. Yeah, there's just yeah. more, there's more uh, generally more risk in EM. So the, there's uh, more attractive valuations uh, in EM. So... As far as uh, investing in uh, S and P 500 companies because they're doing that for you, I think I think one of the big things you're missing out is the opportunity from uh, from the revaluation from some of these low value companies. And another thing is I, but, I don't but have is that, the exact but, data. Yeah. I'm sorry, I just yeah, want to ask yeah. you: Is that all it is? Is a, a multiple um, uh, arbitrage that you could have a company selling bottled water locally, trading 13 times, where a huge U.S. company is selling bottled water? In, in South America is trading 18 times, and so you just simply have a better valuation, or is there more to it than that? I think the main factor is value, is the valuation. Um, I think that a- another thing that you're getting, a it's a more of a pure play if you're investing mm-hmm. in an EM company versus the whatever uh, company that you are invested in. Uh, and I, I'm not sure exactly what the revenue exposure from S&P 500 companies is to EM. I assume it's maybe around 25% or Somewhere, Close enough, there, something in the range there. of half of half. So, mm-hmm. in generally speaking, only twenty-five, you know, or so percent of the revenues is going to be from EM anyway. So you're not getting 
uh, it, it's hard to uh, China, China distorts it so much because of the silly idea that China is still an emerging economy. Right. Mm-hmm. That's another thing. Classification is always a big issue. Yeah. Sure. With, with the yeah. Yeah, but I really I think it's valuation arbitrage, but and and then the peer play aspect. But that, those two things come together in the sense that if fifty percent of your company is selling um, a product to a, a customer base that's growing at two percent a year, and fifty percent is growing to a place that's growing the customer base at twenty percent a year. Sure. That's a different thesis than a company that is actually local and domestic in that EM where their whole customer base is growing 20% yeah, a year. Right. So you get valuation benefits, and then, and then you, I, in my mind, have an entirely different set of growth initiatives out of the company. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah I wanted to add one thing I think is maybe we should think about these countries you know, are still being quite close, and still um, it's really hard yeah. for foreigners to uh, come and, and, you know, and compete you know, fairly. It's not like the U.S. or the U.K. where it's like you, know, you come with money and you can invest like anyone else. I think you still have the local advantage, you know, being a Chinese, being an Indian company, you get access or you get you know, because of connection with the government or because they're still relatively you know, opening economies. You can get access to markets that you know American companies cannot get access to. So you know, it's like when you see some, you know, we have an example: pharmaceutical company buying a Chinese, uh, local, you know, a Chinese uh, distribution company because they think with them they have a much better chance of being able to sell their drugs in China. So I, I think that's you know that's also a reason why you want to go directly buy these companies and in yeah. you know world leaders in their own market. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. and it can be uh, close to impossible to do without a uh, without a manager that has uh, relationships with brokers and and these different local you know, absolutely e- economies. I mean, I mean, the the only if you were to open up uh, you know a TD Ameritrade account and then try to buy some of these companies, you'd be your universe would be ADRs and a totally different set of companies. Uh, then putting money with a trusted manager is able to have a a more selection in the entire universe. So. Well, here, here's another point that we haven't touched on that Von Tobel has really hit home to me in the last yeah. couple meetings we had with them. Um, we have telecom exposure in our U.S. dividend equity portfolio, and we view telecom the way we're invested in it as part of the more defensive aspects of what we're doing. We don't expect high CAGRs in their growth, but we do expect strong balance sheet. We expect almost kind of monopolistic tendencies. There's not a lot of huge players, really good cash flows and really good dividend yield. And we've had a couple of different companies in the portfolio over the years. The one we have right now is, I think, one of the more defensive low beta names that we own. Great addition. But if you want growth out of telecom and there's other sectors, certain parts of the financials you could say this about, emerging markets are going to have some local companies that provide a totally different growth profile than you can get in the U.S., you're not going to get a real sexy growth story out of telecom mm-hmm. in the United States. I and mean, we got that 20, 25 years ago. Of course, World Cup, yeah. the guy went to jail and everything. But my point was those were hot right. growing companies. So. Yeah. Now in Indonesia and in India and another EM, telecom is not a value sector or a boring sector no. or a utility. It, it's a growth sector. No, and, that, and that's yeah. you got to be an EM to participate. It's kind of like in the thir- in the 30s in the US where Same. utilities were a growth sector totally yeah so it's, yeah. yeah it's 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 again yeah. it goes back yeah. to that emerging middle class yeah i really it's, think it's that really that is. consumer story of the multinationals are doing the job for you is a lazy person story and if it applies anywhere it's only in certain consumer products mm-hmm. most of the people will use a certain very large uh, carbonated beverage company as their example for it but i think that's an exception not the rule really i you look at financials and all the growth mm-hmm. drivers of a kind of diversified financial company um, all I know was that when I first started investing in EM, the banks in India didn't have ATM machines. Yeah. And I promise you that the big three mega banks in U.S. were not in the market to go make ATM machines in India. So you had to buy an Indian local bank to sort of get that growth opportunity of what was going to scale into a more mm. modernized financial system. Mm. So you just have to have the the broader right. universe totally. to, to and, draw from. And yeah. it, Right. And like you said, sometimes it's... How are you going to provide banking solutions to, uh, let's say, like an Indian growing middle class if you're not if you don't actually have a localized presence, or maybe pack consumer packaged goods? That might be a might be a bit different story. Or, or and especially in yeah. EM, the, especially uh, if you look at the trajectory of of countries that are growing from frontier markets to EM to developed, the financial services is a huge component of that. Yeah. That, that capital markets 
uh, having that capital markets presence in order to provide entrepreneurs capital and provide businesses the lifeblood that they need to be able to produce these services. And, this, and the financial services is an interesting point because yeah. that, that's hard – that's hard to, to if you're going to make the argument that you're going to own S and P 500 companies and then you're going to get exposure to emerging markets because mm-hmm. they're going to you know they're going to have a percentage of revenues from there and the financial services I mean to know the capital markets to know geopolitical to, to understand you know in financial markets whether you're lending or or investment banking or whatever you're going to do to understand local markets you need to be a local company yeah. that's going to do that it's really hard for a real big company to come in and, and and do that and so maybe they'll acquire other countries or companies there that already do it that's fine. But I think that's an exciting paradigm yeah, there as that's well. that's even possible. Julian, yeah. we did a, a podcast some time back about uh, our philosophy at Bonson Group, about active versus passive. We talked about ETFs versus individual stocks. And and um, one of the things that we talked about was, sure, when the whole entire market's rising, the vast majority of index investors are getting a great return. And, and most active guys are really hugging the index anyways. A lot of them don't outperform. Emerging markets is totally different. Emerging markets is one of the very interesting equity asset classes where even in a good market, the majority of active managers have outperformed. Why do you think that is? What's different? Is it index construction problems? Um, Good question. I guess I would say without really knowing, I would guess that there's much more money that's uh, actively managed in in emerging market, and it's probably because the majority is not index uh, driven it's more stock uh, you know you have mostly stock pickers that the you know the alpha or like that the you know they pick their own winners and that's i would say that's probably the reason why uh, why it's happening but think, that's my that would be a guess because i'm not sure i have no yeah. idea i mean i think it, it comes back to what we talked about on the on the commodity play of things too mm-hmm. when you look at an index i mean it's it's currency uh, sensitive just because of the commodity exposure in the top 10 names you know it's Very it's, it's so. oil and 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 you know a lot of energy names and 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 so on and so forth and so you get you know indexes that move a certain direction but if you have an active manager for example the, the two that we use um, you get this huge outperformance because they're able to sort of you know not focus on that and not have to be kind of a market weighted index and they can actually kind of invest in that consumer uh, the local consumer a very export heavy very commodity heavy mm-hmm. index and um, and especially yeah like the you said focus on something totally different and also classification in EMs d- difficult uh frontier like you said china uh, china is still in still in em uh S- south korea is still in you know the, i mean the classification is difficult and who says exactly what an em is or what a dm is or what a frontier market is you may have a very different opinion uh being an investor in that space and uh being having the a little bit of flexibility around maybe be, being able to put maybe some a frontier market in your uh, portfolio as an EM manager uh, might have a little bit of advantage of the index, but primarily it's the story of uh, it. The the EM index tells a whole different story mm-hmm. than if you look at the composition of the managers that we invest in. Absolutely, where it's mainly consumer oriented, and the, obviously the the uh, EM index is very commodity heavy, export heavy. Yeah. yeah. So. Well, I will uh, wrap us up with, with that. I think we've covered a lot of ground today and got a lot of good feedback. And, and for those of you listening that have, this has provoked some further questions in, uh, we certainly welcome your questions, comments. Uh, we'd love to unpack this a bit more. Look, we're humble enough and, and cognizant enough of the geopolitical volatility, currency volatility that is correlated there, too, that we don't take a massive weighting in the asset class. We probably overweight most global benchmarks, but in terms of even our own kind of absolute weighting, it's a single digit weighting for those clients we think it's appropriate for, for the most part, maybe low double digits for certain more aggressive clients. We're not looking to go put 20, 30, let alone 50% of client capital in the EM, but we do think there's a growth story that has a value uh, uh, basis for investing. And, And it is fundamentally driven and it's company driven, bottom up, and, and, and I would like to conclude with something that was a fundamental, game-changing factoid in my understanding of this. And that was 1993 to 2013, 20-year period, covered a lot of geopolitical events, covered a lot of macro, and yet you had one country immediately to the United States South that had grown their economy at about 1% to 2% a year, had been in recession about half of that time, and that was Mexico. Their stock market was up 18.6% for 20 years. Then you had a country on the other side of the world that had gone through the largest CAGR, compound annual growth rate of economic growth of any country in history in that period, and that was China. 
and that they had essentially grown something in the range of real GDP growth, net of inflation, 8 9 10% a year for 20 years, and their stock market was dead flat, maybe up 1% a year. The decorrelation between economic growth and company performance, stock market performance, earnings, is massive. It's true even in the U.S., where sometimes there's a big decoupling from GDP growth and, and, and uh, earnings results, but it's even more true in a lot of the emerging market stories. So simply saying, I like Minnesota, does not give you a good investment result. I like China, I don't like India, it doesn't mean anything. Investors need companies because the point of investing is to compound your capital around earnings growth. Earnings growth comes from free enterprise. Free enterprise is the greatest gift for enhancing the quality of life and the results of your portfolio in human history. We're glad to be investing alongside this world-changing phenomena. Thank you for listening to this week's Dividend Cafe. We will come back to you next week with all of our best ideas and thoughts about whatever we can come up with, <laughs> depending on the subject at hand. Thanks so much.